Well, hello, 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 hello. This is R.C. Blakes, and welcome back to Let's Talk with R.C. Blakes. And I want to just talk about it today. I have a very powerful um, discussion for us today that um, I think will prove to be very helpful and practical for quite a lot of people, actually male and female. Um, We're talking today about how to mentally detach from a relationship. How many of you know that um, there are many times we are physically gone, we are emotionally gone, but mentally we are still hung up in toxic relationships. We know better. We know that um, the situation is not something that uh, really suits us. We know that this person has no place in our lives, but mentally we are still incarcerated to the idea of the relationship. I wrote this book, and I want you to go to Amazon You can either go to Amazon or you can go to uh, rcblakesstore.com, I think it is, and um, you can pick this book up, Soul Ties, Breaking the Ties That Bind. When you find yourself in a situation where you're physically separate from a person, uh, you're emotionally spent but you are, there's still something that connects you. In the book, we say a soul tie is defined as a spiritual and emotional connection that ties one person's life to another. That is what you're dealing with. And um, there's a song when I was younger the the words went something like this your body's here with me but your mind is on the other side of town you messing me around that's the words of the song it's because though a person is physically has physically departed though a person has emotionally um departed maybe even chose to break the situation off Many times the soul is still attached. And there's some work that has to happen for the individual to get the soul detached. Because the condition of a person, you know, when we think about a person that um, breaks off a relationship, but is still being mentally or is still mentally attached is, in psychological terms, I just gave you a spiritual concept of soul ties, but in psychological terms, it's called an emotional attachment. Some of the more modern language calls it an emotional entanglement. It's when a person is is so um, intertwined, enmeshed in your soul that, you know, it's almost like the the baby powder on the black dress or the black suit. How do you separate it? You know, the more you try to, to, to get away from it, the more it appears. It's an emotional entanglement. And this describes a situation where an individual has difficulty detaching emotionally from a relationship that they know, the person, him or herself, they know that this does not work for me, and they pull away from it. They, they, they say, I'm done with this, and they think just the act of breaking it off, just the act of saying I'm done is enough to break the attachment. 
And then they discover that even after the physical relationship is ended, they are still psychologically, the soul is still connected. So I want to talk about how to mentally detach from a relationship. This is why I say, this is why I say it is um, not wise to come out of one relationship and to jump into another. It's because you have to do the work to detach before you reattach. Now, an emotional or psychological attachment can manifest in various ways. I listed three. When you know that you are, you know that you have a, a mental a, attachment to this person, even though you called it off, even though you said this is over, even though you said. I know this is not the person for me, but after the fact, when you're in a different place from the person, when, when, when you're uh, separated from the person, the person is, uh, you know, uh, in another part of the world or in another part of uh, the country, you know that you have this attachment when you ruminate. In other words, when you're constantly thinking about the ex-partner, when you're replaying memories, you know that you still have this attachment when you hold on to all of these pictures. You know that you still attach, brother, when you're holding on to all of these panties. Oh, yeah, that's what the brothers do. The brothers, the brothers hold on to the panties. And when it when 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 he didn't told Jezebel to go on about her business. He still got them panties in the back of the drawer. Oh, yeah. Sisters hold on to those wife beaters, you know, with the, with the scent of that, 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 that creed in it, you know, that cologne. She still got that in it. She got a whole new man and a family, but she still got that wife beater hidden up in the trunk up under the tie in, in a Ziploc bag. She go in there and sniff it every now and then. Your body's here with me. But your mind is on the other side of town. You're ruminating, constantly thinking about the ex-partner, replaying memories, remembering conversations and scenarios in the mind. You know that you have this psychological attachment, this emotional bond to this person uh, when there's a sense of regret Though, though you knew that it was over, you knew it needed to be over. Now that it is supposedly over, you're constantly second-guessing the decision to detach. Wonder if I made the right choice. What do you mean you wonder if you made the right choice? The kind of abuse, the kind of humiliation, degradation this person brought you through. And you sitting there talking about you wonder if you made the right right choice. You're ruminating, you're regretting. Then you know that you have this unhealthy mental attachment to this person, this soul tie, if you would. Again, go to Amazon, go to rcblakestore.com, pick it up today. You need it in your life. Fact about it on at rcblakes.com. Uh, there's a whole soul ties. Um, there, there's a whole soul ties breaking soul ties uh, online program. Go and check it out today. But you know that you have this attachment when you're ruminating, when you're second guessing yourself, you're regretting, and when you still feel a sense of responsibility. You know how many times I have to tell. Women especially, more so than men, that that ex-partner is no longer your responsibility. It's not your job to worry about if they're eating. That's not your job. This is a grown individual. This is not your child. This is a grown person. It's not your job to worry about if they're taking their medicine, if they're paying their bills. 
That's not your responsibility. You are not that man's woman anymore. You are not that woman's man anymore. But there's this phantom responsibility that keeps you feeling like it's your job to meet their needs after the relationship or the situationship is over. It's said that a person that um, experiences an amputation from time to time has this phantom feeling that the leg is still there and and will sometimes move out and step out on a leg that is no longer there. Well, I think this, you know, I think that illustrates how I believe this phantom responsibility manifests in the life of a person that uh, is still attached to somebody that they are supposed to be detached from. You still feel like it's your job to step in and dun 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 save the day. You've been Superman long enough for an ungrateful woman. You've been you've been Wonder Woman long enough for uh, you know an ungrateful man. But this state of emotional attachment can prolong the healing process, and it can impede personal growth and the ability to move forward. I remember so vividly. Can I just take my time? Can I just take my time and just talk to y'all today? I remember when I first started this, man, I would just sit and just take my time and just really. But I remember so vividly um, when my life started changing, when God really started delivering me from uh, just the, the buffoonery of misogyny, womanizing, and all of the like. And, um, man, I, start, I started literally changing my life. And um, a part, major part of that was that God said, okay, you got you to gotta get your sex life together, man. You're just running with all of these women. I can't do great things in you as long as you're living so low. You, you, you're vibrating on a low level. I can't bring you into high frequencies with this. And so the first thing I did was I sanctified my sex life as a young single man. When you all, a lot of times when folk hear me share this testimony of uh, my season of abstinence, they, they assume that I was an old guy. I was a very young guy. I was in my 20s right? God did this for me when I was in my 20s. And, but long story short, when, when, I made a decision, when I made the decision to honor God in my sex life, I needed to experience the power of abstinence. I was on the Hartley Initiated show with the guys, uh, Tayshawn and Ryan, the other day, and, and, and I was talking about how ideally a man should perfect the discipline of abstinence to assure himself that he has the, the power or the discipline to be monogamous or faithful. When I married Lisa, I knew that I could be faithful because I had already come to a place where I had sanctified and consecrated my sex life to the, to, to the Lord, to God. And, but here's the point I'm trying to make. You know, Baptist preachers got to go all the way around the corner to go next door. The point I'm trying to make is when I made that decision, I discovered that I had attachments, soul ties that I did not realize were there. I thought that I had run game and that I had uh, created this connection between me and the me and certain women to my advantage but when I when I really got ready to um align my life with God's perfect will I discovered I was as much bound to them as they were to me and a lot of times we as men we feel like well we're on the best end of this deal and you know, we running game on, on the sisters and, you know, we got it like that. Not realizing that beneath the surface, we are as much in bondage to these women 
as they are to us. And I had all of these attachments, man. And I, I'm, 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 you know, I've made a decision to live for God. And at certain times, certain triggers would hit, certain music would play, certain ideas would come into my mind. And I would think about this one. Then I would think about that one. Then I would think about this one. Usually with women, women abound in terms of soul ties to one, you know, one man at a time. But a, a perverted man many times has soul ties to multiple women. And when he really makes a decision to live his life aligned with God's perfect will, and he, he's really trying to rise in his king consciousness, he discovers these attachments that he never really realized that he had. And so it took me a minute to break free from that. And it was, I've never been addicted to drugs, but I imagine that it's quite like you know, a junkie trying to come off of uh, substance abuse. But now let's get into this. Let's get into this. Let's get into this discussion today. Um, because we're actually talking about how to mentally detach from a, from a, a relationship. The first thing you're going to do, number one, and, and a lot of these points are things that I had to do. I just didn't have language things that I did rather, I just didn't have language for it uh, in that season. My language, my life experiences, and my studies had not gone as deep. But when I look back on it, I realize that now I have language for the process that Holy Spirit actually walked me through. Number one, you're going to have to do a self-worth audit. Somebody put that in the chat. Put that in the comments. Number one, a self-worth audit. Because the very first step is to take inventory of your self-esteem levels. When you have, when you have stepped away from a relationship that has proven not to be viable, the first thing you got to do is take inventory of your self-esteem levels. Because when a relationship is obviously over, if your self-esteem is not adequate, the gravitational pull of that relationship will keep you stuck in a cycle of hanging on. You keep ruminating. You keep experiencing the phantom responsibilities, you know, all of the like. If, if, if your self-esteem is not intact, if you don't have a sufficient self-esteem, your low self-esteem will keep you in a position where you're constantly pulled back into this toxic situation. And so your body will be here, but your mind will always be stuck over there. And as a consequence, you'll never really be able to create any foundation for a healthy relationship moving forward because internally you're still connected because your self-worth, you find that your self-worth was attached to your relational status. Now, Here's a self-worth affirmation. Here's a self-worth affirmation. Um, repeating after me, my self-worth is not defined by my relationship status. I am a valuable and complete person on my own. My happiness and sense of self come from within me, not from being with someone else. These are the kinds of things you have you will have to say to yourself on a daily basis because when when a person has been a fixture in your life and you had as much confidence in this person being a part of your life for the rest of your life, many times you will find that, when you detach from them, a piece of yourself 
you know, identity, a piece of your self-worth, a piece of your self-esteem is pulled away in the process. Now, here's something you have to, you're going to have to be aware of, and that is if you don't deal with, um, if you don't deal with this self-worth issue apart from this individual, here's the contrasting behavior. Defining, if this, this, here's the contrasting behavior. You will define self-worth based on a relationship status or a partner's approval. If you're still in need of this person approving of you for you to feel worthy, you know what happens? You're going to constantly follow them on social media you're going to constantly try to seek their approval. You're going to constantly put up pictures hoping they like it. And if they don't like it, there's going to, it's going to trigger something in you. And it's this dependence on external validation that undermines a woman's or even a man's self-esteem, making them more likely to tolerate toxic behavior in fear of losing their source of perceived worth. That's where a lot of you all are now. You, you've, not done, you've not done the work to really deal with your self-esteem, and now it's your low self-esteem, your low self-worth that's constantly you know, triggering you and pulling you back into this situation so that you you're physically separate, but psychologically, you've never left. But by affirming your self-worth independently, independent of your relational status, you can empower yourself to recognize your intrinsic value. See, I had, when I was in this situation, um, I was defining my self-worth by my sexual conquest. And Having all of these women, man, I used to love to go certain places with them and, and uh, you know, and I pull up or, and I step in, you know, guys would look at me a certain way because, you know, you know, a, a man, men judge a man by the kind of woman he has on his arm and different places. I, I would bring different women for obvious reasons. The players know what I mean. And, and when I didn't have that, I had to grapple with my, my self-worth, and I had to grapple with the idea of me being worth something apart from all of these connections, and it was this self-realization that fostered confidence and diminished the perceived need for external validation. So I got to a point where I grew to a point where I did not need I just did not need to have a woman to feel like I was the man. I was a young, abstinent Christian man, and I did not feel the need to have women to validate my manhood. Now, watch this. When I, when I made these moves and I, uh, I got to a point where I was cool with just me and the creator, and uh, women saw that I really had changed. The first thing they said was, you know, he's gay. Robert is gay. They didn't call me RC. Then they called me Robert or they called me Bob. If you walk up on me, you call me Bob or Bobby. I know you know me from way, way, way back in the day. And I thought that to be funny. I guess if we had social media at that time, I would probably, there would probably be stuff on social media now of people calling me gay from back then. But, you know, anybody that, that that's listened to me, you know, for more than three minutes, you know, it ain't nothing gay about me. Ray Charles was blind and is presently dead, and he can still see and testify that there ain't nothing gay about R.C. Blakes. But that's what they said. But that didn't bother me because I had done the work on my own personal self-esteem Going back to Psalm 139 and 14, which says, I praise you because I am fearfully and I'm wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know this full well. I'm convinced of it in my own soul. 
I don't need no external validation. My internal witness is enough. Now, um, here's a scenario. I, I tried to create like little scenarios, or almost like little brief stories for each point. And I call this one the empire of self-esteem. Emma has always seen herself through the lens of her relationships. After a recent breakup, instead of seeking validation from someone new, she starts a journey of self-discovery. She takes an art class, reconnecting with her long-lost passion for painting, and starts to build her self-esteem around her own talents and accomplishments rather than relational status. Now, number uh, two. I have these misnumbered. Okay, this is number two. Uh, anchor yourself to a growth mindset. This is how you're going to mentally detach from a bogus relationship. Do your self-worth audit. Do your self-worth work. Number two, anchor yourself to a growth mindset. In other words, reframe your thoughts about the relationship and the breakup. This involves shifting from a focus on lost love to an understanding of growth and learning from the experience. It's about changing the narrative from victimhood to empowerment, recognizing the strengths that come from enduring tough times. So you're going to anchor yourself to a growth mindset. You're not going to sit around and just uh, take a old me, oh my kind of an attitude towards this thing. You're going to anchor yourself to a growth mindset. Whatever doesn't kill me makes me stronger. And rather than sitting here lamenting something that I know was necessary, this breakup was necessary, I'm going to anchor myself to a growth mindset. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to do like the, the bodybuilder. I'm going to push through the pain with a revelation of uh, the perceived outcome. Adopting a growth mindset, a guy by the name of uh, Simon Sinek, um, says adopting a growth mindset allows successful individuals to reframe negative situations by focusing on what they can control, their response. This proactive stance helps them to remain composed under pressure and to make decisions that align with their long-term goals rather than reacting out of fear or frustration. So though you're dealing with the, the fear of a new normal, the fear of doing life without this person, though your, your good common sense says this was necessary, though you have a witness in your spirit that you discern, I needed to be out of this situation, you're going to have to work with your mind or your soul, and you're going to have to not allow, prevent your mind from just constantly shifting to Oh, I'm a victim, how hard it is, how difficult it is to face this new normal, to live without this person. And you're going to have to embrace the, the growth mindset that through these trials, through this difficult situation, I am becoming a stronger person. I'm becoming a wiser person. If you don't do this, here's the contrasting behavior. Viewing the relationships end as a personal failure without learning from the experience. If you don't take a growth mindset, you will go through all that you're going through, and the contrasting uh, behavior will be that you will go through it, but never grow through it. You will learn nothing from it. You have to stop entertaining the wasted energy of, oh, how difficult this is. Oh, I'm going through so much. What a waste of time. And you have to embrace, I'm going to learn everything I need to learn. I'm going to take in all of the lessons that I need to take in from this experience. And I'm not going to make any more of these mistakes. Because by, by internalizing the end of a relationship, 
as a failure, a woman might blame herself unnecessarily, leading to a cycle of low self-esteem and making her vulnerable to staying in or returning to unhealthy relationships. Watch this. If you don't take on a growth mindset, you may not return to this person, but you know what will happen? You will go and you will formulate a new relationship with the same kind of guy on another, on the other side of town. You'll, you'll stay on the same frequency, going through it, never growing through it, and repeating the same cycle with different men or with different women. Accepting the end of a relationship as an opportunity for growth rather than a failure empowers a woman to learn from her experiences and to apply these lessons to future relationships, leading to a more fulfilling life. No wonder the Bible says in Romans 8, 28, and we, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Everything is supposed to work out for our good, but it will not work out for your good if you're not learning from it. Now, here's my other little scenario, my little short story, and I call this the alchemy of heartbreak. When Zoe's relationship ended, she initially felt like a complete failure. With time, she began to see the breakup as a crucible for transformation. She reflected on the relationship and recognized patterns she wanted to change. Zoe started attending a support group, turning her pain into a path for personal growth and helping others along the way. You're going to have to, you're going to have to anchor yourself to a growth mindset and not just give in to the tendency to view yourself as a victim or a pitiful case. Number three, you're going to have to reframe the loneliness. Because how I many of you know when when you are when you are exiting a relationship that you had great hopes in, you go through some real serious waves of loneliness, especially when that relationship was, you know, intended to be lifelong, when it was sexual, when it was, you know, em you were emotionally involved. Sometimes you don't even have to have sex with a person and to create. Even in a book, I talk about how, you know, you, you a person can create an emotional soul tied to you. And it can be as difficult to get over a person that you've never slept with as it can be to get over a person that you had an ongoing sexual relationship with because of the loneliness factor. Feeling lonely is a natural human emotion and does not reflect inadequacy on your part. What, what can, here's the question, what can loneliness teach me about what I need and what I want in life? While you're sitting there and you're just lamenting the idea of being by yourself or being the idea of the concept of, of loneliness, the reality is um, you're in a classroom that you can learn a lot from if you pay attention to the blackboard. God is teaching you something. You can learn a lot about yourself, what works for you, what you need, what you want. Another question, how can I use this time by myself to reconnect with myself and my own interests? Did, have you noticed that the relationship really took you far, far, far away from your interest and you became consumed with the interest of the other person? Understanding that loneliness is a universal human experience allows a woman to confront and manage these feelings constructively, using the time to build a stronger relationship with God, with her friends, her family, and even herself. Now, when I thought about it, when I just really paused and I thought about it, um, loneliness 
may be the misinterpretation of a divine opportunity for growth. Because, you know, man, I, you know, when I made that decision, I went through, I went through some serious loneliness, you know, people withdrawal is deep when you're used to people being around and all of a sudden you make decisions that put you in the house by yourself. And, um, you know, that's, that's some real stuff. I know sometimes y'all listen to me and it feels like I'm removed from it and I don't know what that feels like, but I went through all of that, you know. But I also discovered that that loneliness may be the misinterpretation of a divine opportunity for growth. What you're calling loneliness may really be loaded with divine opportunities. Think about it this way. Jesus, for those of you that are Christian and Bible readers, Jesus consistently put himself in situations of solitude. What Jesus relished and found value in is the exact predicament most of us lament or we call loneliness. Jesus put himself in an isolated position away from everybody else. And it was there that he strengthened and he perfected and he became the better version of himself, if there's such a thing. He was perfect, right? But I'm just using language that we can relate to. And and while while Jesus valued solitude, we hate it. We call it loneliness. But throughout the Gospels, Jesus often withdraws to lonely places to pray and to commune with God the Father, suggesting that solitude is an important part of spiritual life. One such, you know, when you think about it, maybe what Jesus did intentionally, maybe the, maybe the Heavenly Father does for us because we are not wise enough or strong enough to do it for ourselves. So maybe you need to reframe this this season of loneliness, and maybe you need to view it as an opportunity for great growth. If you go to Mark chapter 1 and 35 uh, in the New International Version, uh, let's see. Uh, Let me go there, because I don't think I, I didn't actually jot the scripture down, Mark 1.35. Listen to what it says. Give me a second to get there. Mark 1.35 reads like this. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. So Jesus intentionally put himself in a position of loneliness. Uh, Thomas Merton's work often indicates that, a great theologian, that in the silence and stillness of being alone, one can become more aware of the inner self and the presence of God. Loneliness is not simply a void. Listen to this. Listen to what Merton says. It is not simply a void, but a fertile ground for spiritual cultivation. This perspective does not deny the pain or challenge of loneliness, but reframes it as an opportunity for growth and a deeper understanding of one's purpose and connection to the divine. Maybe maybe the prayer you've been praying about, Lord, reveal my purpose. Maybe this is the beginnings of understanding that purpose. Now, if you don't understand and if you don't reframe loneliness, here's the contrasting impact. Fearing loneliness to the extent of avoiding it at all costs, even if it means staying in a toxic relationship. So if you don't deal with it, you will fear the idea of loneliness to the point that you will just stay in an abusive and a toxic relationship for infinity. The fear of being alone can drive a woman to cling to a damaging partnership. And this fear-based approach can prevent her or even him 
from facing and processing their feelings constructively. Deuteronomy 31 and 6 reads like this, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Now here's my little, uh, my little short story, so to speak. And I call this one Solitude Symphony. Here's the, here's the scenario. After her divorce, Layla felt an overwhelming sense of loneliness. Instead of rushing into a new romance, she embraced solitude. Layla started solo hiking trips, finding peace in nature's company. There she discovered a strength and independence she had forgotten, composing a new harmonious life and a new approach to living. Now here's number four. Here's number four. I only have seven points. Let me hear them, see if I can get through. I'm just, I'm just talking like I'm talking like I ain't got nowhere else to go. Uh, let's see. Number four. Number four. Uh, here's number four. Take the occasion to actually define your needs. This is how you mentally detach from a toxic relationship or a relationship that did not work. Sometimes, listen to this statement very carefully. Sometimes you didn't get what you needed from a relationship because you never asked for it. You never asked for it because you never knew what you needed. You never knew what you needed because you've never been alone long enough to figure it out. But here's the question. What do you truly need from a relationship? Have you been settling for less than you deserve? It is important to understand these things to set healthy boundaries and to stick to them, ensuring that your emotional and psychological needs are met in any upcoming relationship. Now, if you don't uh, take occasion to actually define your needs and establish these boundaries, here's the contrasting impact. Neglecting your own needs and failing to establish or enforce personal boundaries. You will be a person that will neglect your needs and, and you, will become a, uh, you will become a toxic empath. You'll be feeling everybody else and giving yourself to their needs while, while yours are never met in a relationship context. Without clear boundaries, a person may allow toxic behavior to continue unchecked, sacrificing your own well-being to keep the peace or to maintain the situationship. Recognizing and asserting your needs and boundaries in relationships helps you to maintain your integrity and avoid repeating past patterns that may not have served you well. Does that make sense to you? That you need to take the occasion this time rather than sitting around, you know, you, you, you've separated from this person. Think about what you need. Did this person actually give you what you need? No, they did not. What do you need? I need A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Did they give me A, B, C, D, E, F, and G? No, they only gave me G. And G is usually sex, right? Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. If you don't know what you need in your own heart, you're going to always make relational decisions that are going to drain you. Here's my little scenario. I call this one Blueprint for Bliss. Maria often sacrificed her needs for the sake of her partners, avoiding conflict. After recognizing this pattern, she decided to draft a blueprint for her happiness, defining her non-negotiables. In her next relationship, she communicated her needs clearly from the start, establishing a healthy foundation for mutual respect and contentment. You're not getting what you want from your partner because you don't know what you want. And because you don't know what you want, you never communicated what you wanted. 
You just know that you're coming up deficient. You don't know where you're deficient. You don't even know why you're deficient. You just know that it didn't work and you never took the time to actually sit with yourself and to actually define your needs. Number five, forgive and flourish. Forgive and flourish. Forgiveness and letting go are important because holding on to resentment or regret does not serve you or anyone else. You know, can I forgive myself and my ex-partner for our shortcomings? That's a question. You know, letting go of what cannot be changed, what it does for you is it frees up emotional space for new experiences. As, as long as you're holding on to unforgiveness, it's cluttering your uh, it's cluttering your soul. You don't have room to entertain anything good or new because it's you, your your emotional space is consumed by old infractions and and bitterness held on for other people that did not serve you. If you don't deal with the forgiveness, here's here's the contrasting impact: holding on to resentment or returning to the relationship, hoping for change without evidence of improvement. What unforgiveness does is it, it, it anchors you to the person and it does not let you actually break free from them. So as a consequence, a lot of times you find yourself returning to the very person that hurt you because you didn't choose to forgive them. And what is forgiving them is not making what they did right. It's refusing to hold on to it because to hold on to it is to anchor yourself to them. Unresolved bitterness can tether a woman to a toxic relationship as she may either seek retribution or be unable to move on. Alternatively, she might repeatedly forgive without seeing genuine change leading to a cycle of hurt. Because forgiveness is an act of self-empowerment. It releases a woman from the burden of carrying bitterness and it opens the door to new possibilities in peace. I ain't forgiving you for you. I'm forgiving you for me. Colossians 3 and 13 says, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgiveness is a spiritual cleanser. Here's my little scenario. And I call this one the liberation of forgiveness. Anita held on to resentment towards her ex which kept her trapped in a cycle of anger. Through counseling, she learned She learned the power of forgiveness. She wrote a letter to her ex expressing her forgiveness, but never sent it. This act was for her own peace, liberating her from the chains of the past and allowing her to move forward. Now, number six, number six, you got to ask yourself the question in this process of mentally detaching from this relationship. Uh, number six, was this happiness or was this just comfort in familiarity? Was this happiness? I can't seem to shake this. Ask yourself the question, was this really happiness or was this just comfort in familiarity? Recognizing the difference between comfort and happiness is important. Am, am I considering reconnecting with this person because it's comfortable and familiar or because it would truly make me happy? I think we all know the answer. It's not going to make you happy. It didn't make you happy. It's not going to make you happy. You can try it again, but you have to at least be aware that you're doing it because this person is toxic, but they're familiar. So you're going to need to differentiate between the fear of the unknown and what is genuinely best for your emotional well-being. If you don't, here's the contrasting uh, impact. 
confusing the comfort of the known, even if dysfunctional, with genuine happiness. The familiarity of a toxic relationship can be misleadingly reassuring, causing a woman or a person to stay in the situation because it feels safer than facing the uncertainty of change and the discomfort of growth. Are you really happy or is this just familiar? Is that the reason you're struggling with moving on? Is it that you're attached to the familiarity or were you really happy there? Huh? Is the toxic nostalgia getting to you? What is that? That's when you can remember all of the, you can remember the, 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 the three great things, but you're forgetting the 300 catastrophic events you all had. Distinguishing between the comfort of familiarity and the true happiness of a person allows a woman to make choices that align with her long-term well-being rather than short-term emotional relief. Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Here's my little scenario, and I call it the mirage of comfort. Jasmine considered getting back with her ex, mistaking her comfort with the past for happiness. She imagined a dinner with him, feeling the old stresses and arguments resurface. This mental exercise revealed the mirage for what it was, prompting Jasmine to seek genuine happiness rather than the illusion of security in familiarity. Now, number seven, and your boy is out of here. If you're going to mentally detach, you're going to have to develop a future, you're going to have to develop future-oriented goals. You're rehashing yesterday, but it's, you can't live backwards, right, without dying. You just become the walking dead when you live backwards. The question is, if you want to live, we got to know where you're going. What, what are your future goals looking like? You have to envision a positive future for yourself, one that involves your personal ambitions and your dreams. What are your dreams? By, by focusing on your future, you can begin to emotionally disentangle yourself from the past relationship. You see, focusing on your future is like driving by a wreck on the highway, you know, and you're staring at it, you're staring at it, you're staring at it. And you're looking at it in the rear view mirror and you're driving slow because you can't go fast while you're yet moving forward. Or you eventually stop and stare at it. But you know what? The moment you take your eyes off of the rear view mirror and you put your eyes in the windshield and you put, step on the gas and you move forward, the wreck in the rear view mirror gets small and small until you no longer see it. The reason the windshield is bigger than the rear view mirror is because you're supposed to spend more time looking at where you're going than where you've been. So future-oriented goals, what, where are you going? Every time I talk, you talk about him, her, when it was, when it was, I'm hurting so bad. I went, man, that's a year ago. Where are you headed from here? You're dying on your feet. You're the walking dead. Envisioning a positive future is imperative. What does a happy future look like for you? How can you take steps towards that future starting today? Have the power to create a fulfilling life for yourself with or without a partner. You got to know this. If you don't, here's the contrasting impact. Focusing on past memories or fearing you won't find happiness elsewhere, leading to a reluctance to move on. You stay stuck there because you can't see a future because you're not searching for one. So you, you get to a point where you just settle and you take whatever Treatment you got to take, you let them back in your life and you just keep settling because you never envision a future. Idealizing the past or fearing the future can keep a woman anchored to a toxic relationship. It prevents her from visualizing and working towards 
a healthier, happier life without her current partner. Here's my final little scenario. Call it the architect of tomorrow. After a string of unsuccessful relationships, Sophia felt destined for unhappiness. One evening, she sat down and wrote a vivid description of her ideal future, including a loving, supportive partner. This vision board served as a daily reminder that she was the architect of her destiny, inspiring her to make choices that aligned with her desired future. And so I want you to consider these things that we've discussed today as you mentally detach from the old relationship. My prayer for you is that something I've said will resonate to a point that you will break free in Jesus' name. Now, listen, I've talked a long time today. I want you to go to uh, rcblakesstore.com. Pick this up today. Soul Ties, Breaking the Ties That Bind, or go to Amazon, pick it up on Amazon. You can get it on Amazon, and um, you can get it in the, uh, what is it, the ebook version. Uh, yeah, I think, you, I think you might be able to get this one even in the Audible on Amazon. But go and pick that up today. I think it'll bless your life as you endeavor to move forward. Um, while you're at rcblakestore.com, check out all of the online programs. Soul Ties is there as well. Breaking Soul Ties is there. Um, sign up for the mailing list while you're there. Those of you that need counseling, if you look in the description, there is a link for better help counseling. If you use that link, it will connect you with a licensed professional counselor from the convenience of your own home, your office, or wherever you might be, you can have someone who knows what they're doing to talk certain things through. If you use that link, it will afford you 10% off of the cost of their counseling, and uh, they in turn will make a deposit into R.C. Blake's ministries for our recommending them. Go to Amazon, check out all of my books while you're there. Those of you that uh, want to come to Queenology, Go to queenology.net, register today. We have added a new component for the kings. Those of you brothers that may be coming with your ladies to Queenology, well, we're going to have a session with just men where I'm going to discuss kingology. We're going to sit around the table. Brothers that are in Atlanta, you can attend the session for men. Just go to the website, queenology.net. You can find all of the things you you can attend as a man. And uh, we're bridging the gap between the queens and the kings. Thanks to all of you who've sown into our lives. Lisa and I love you so, 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 so much. I appreciate you uh, with all of my heart. They're going to put our cash app in the, um, in the comments or whatever. People have been asking for... Cash App and Zelle as means to give. Well, we're going to accommodate you. I love you. I appreciate you. What am I missing? What am I? Am I missing anything? Am I missing anything? I love you. I appreciate you. You are on top. You're going higher. God has more in store for you. I think this is everything. I think I've gotten everything. I think I've gotten everything. Just know that Lisa and I love you, and we pray for you all of the time. Before you leave today, I need you to like this message. The algorithm has really been messing with our numbers in terms of alerts and putting our, our content in front of people. So we have to do a even a better job. My community always does an amazing job, but I just need you to go above and beyond. Just know that I love you. You're on top. You're going higher. God has more in store for you, so we will see you at the top. God bless you. Until next time, I'm R.C. Blakes.
We here at RC Blakes Ministries want to thank you for spending this time with us today. This time with us today. RC and Lisa are always honored to have you with us. Don't forget to reach out to us by visiting our website at www.rcblakes.com. While you're there, you may join our mailing list and receive a free download of the laws of manifesting your vision by RC Blakes. Also look at all of the online programs by RC. You may find all books written by RC and Lisa. Once again, all of us here at RC Blakes Ministries want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And as we always say, see you at the top. Hello, 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 hello family. This is RC Blakes and I am so thoroughly excited. I'm excited because Queenology 2024 is coming back to Atlanta, Georgia, August the 23rd through the 25th. The host hotel is going to be the Whitley Hotel. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Women are literally coming from around the world. It is a multicultural, multi-generational, multi-racial movement of women from around the world. And I want to invite you and yours to meet Lisa and I in Atlanta, Georgia at the Whitley Hotel, August the 23rd through the 25th for Queenology. For those that have the Royal Court package, it will afford you your entire stay for the weekend. It will also afford you a private formal dinner with Lisa and I to open Queenology up. It also affords you admission to every event, everything that's happening for the entire weekend. Now, we also have the Saturday brunch and intensive uh, package, which allows you to get into the brunch where Lisa and I will be sharing the messages that God has given us for 2024 to share with the ladies. This year, I'll have my own message and Lisa will also have her very own message. It's going to be powerful. During the Saturday brunch and intensive, we're also going to have a very distinguished panel of men that are going to sit before the queens and answer the questions that women have always wanted to ask men. It's going to be amazing. Now, also those that are part of the VIP experience, there will be a time where Lisa and uh, the ladies will gather uh, in what they call, I think, the pajama party. And it will be a time where women will have conversation among women. I'm really excited about the culmination of Queenology this year because none other than the incomparable Dave Hollister is coming to be a part of our closing event, the All White Party. He's going to sing the Queenology theme song as well as entertain the ladies, the queens, for that evening. Queenology 2024 promises to be like none other. Those of you that want information, if you desire to be a vendor, queenology.net. Those of you that may need payment plans, queenology.net. Let nothing stop you from making your way to Queenology 2024 in Atlanta, Georgia this year. Tickets are going very quickly. I would love for you to meet us in Atlanta, August the 23rd through the 25th. Queens from around the world are coming. Queens from around the world are rising. It is going to be a coronation. It is going to be a crowning.